I'm doing uh, ports and harbors in East Africa. As soon as I get to go out and do the magnet on the beach on there. That's good. That's good. I just invited you to put some others in the bottom of today. Yeah, it's like this. Principal, just, uh, yeah. I've tried to do stuff on the whole, yeah, span from early Eddie all the way through to post about some little bit of paper and on the post about even Kipper Bay. So I need some money to come on. Uh, Where are you doing that? Uh, the um, the, the, the SPRA and the North Park Road Society. Uh, it's like as long as you can get that, it's going to get snowed in somewhere else. I get stuck and then Jen is going back in from Robin's explanation in the pool. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. She's still working with Robin, is she? Yeah, she's going to have to do that. Yeah, she's going to have to do that. Yeah, she's going to have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, no, I have a dozen versions of this, all of which have been varyingly reworked. Yeah. In the back of him. Those demonstrations are just beautiful. It's going to be fantastic. So hopefully, that someone will come and face it clean and maybe actually dig in, dig in the holes. So, yeah, we're going down the um, crowdfunding route. So, that's going to be interesting. I, it could either, either work really well. <laughs> it could all go horribly wrong, and <laughs> so we end up having no money at all. But I'm kind of I'm fairly optimistic. I think it's a site where it's going to have a public profile. This is something to do about it. It's actually going to be a lot of money. Again, it's like a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of money. Yeah. It's a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of the we can use that on the press of the list. So it's all 
Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming along to this talk seminar tonight. Um, I'm very pleased tonight to be able to introduce uh, Dr. David Pett of Durham University. Uh, David uh, was, in fact, an undergraduate here at York some time ago. I won't say how long. <laughs> Um, uh, before going on to do his uh, master's and his PhD at Reading, um, before joining the Durham. Um, you'll know David for any number of reasons. Um, in the news in particular in the last couple of years, you will have seen his name in association with the Pompey of the North uh, at Rome and Winchester. Um, uh, but he's here tonight to talk about his new project at Holy Island, which will be starting next year. Um, so without any further ado, I will hand you over to David Pets. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Yeah, it's 25 years ago since I started as an undergraduate, which is slightly depressing to be honest. <laughs> um, what I want to talk about today, is, as Tom said, is I'm hoping to start a new field season on Holy Island next summer. Um, and this has given me an opportunity, the planning this has, has got me thinking and trying to essentially draw together all the sources for um, the archaeology of, of Holy Island. Um, it's a very well-known site. I'll fill in a little bit for those of you who don't know it in a minute, but it's a very well-known site. But compared with other, other similar early medieval sites like Iona, it's seen remarkably little um, fieldwork. And what little fieldwork there has been has often remained unpublished. So my first task has been to try and pull all this material together. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be drawing on, the, on these sources. Holy Island is one of these kind of iconic sites which regularly appears whenever you see whenever there's a program program with robson green in you can almost guarantee at some point he will be wrestling fish off in the sun or, or something similar it's, it's it's a very very iconic site very very closely connected with the kind of wide public perceptions of of northumbria northumberland and in this world of, of game of thrones and the world of um vikings where you can see Lindisan reconstructed very very badly uh and last kingdom and all, the, all, all these programs the, the the kind of the public profile of, of this golden age of, of Northumbria, which Lindisfarne is so closely connected, is, is very, very high at the moment. And of course, a couple of years ago, we had the Lindisfarne Gospels, which were almost certainly produced on Lindisfarne. They uh, were liberated, they escaped from the uh, British Library and spent a summer um, residing in, in Palace Green Library up at Durham. So it's, it's a site which, which generates an, an awful lot of, of, of public interest. And it's clearly a key site for understanding the, the emergence of, of the early medieval kingdoms of Northumbria. Um, for those of you who don't know where, where Holy Island or Lindisfarne, and we can use those two names uh, interchangeably, don't, don't know where it is. It's a small, small island, tidal island, as you'll see in a minute, just off the, the, the very far northeastern coast of Northumberland, so about 10 miles south 
of the Scottish border. It's um, about three miles long. It's this very distinctive teardrop, teardrop shaped site. And as you visit it now, you come along a causeway along this end here from Beale. And this, this area called the Snook is, is basically covered in sand dunes. As you can see, the northern part of the island is almost entirely covered in sand dunes, whilst the, the main body of the, of the island over in the east, currently that landscape is dominated by an enclosed, improved agricultural field system from the mid 18th century. And the, the village of, of Holy Island, well, Holy Island Village itself, stands here, right in the, in the corner, and there are the remains of the medieval priory, we'll talk about that in a minute, and there's wonderful views across down towards Bamber Castle and looking down the coast of the Northumbrian coast. It's a very picturesque location, not surprisingly today, it attracts uh, a, a lot of tourists. But well, one of the first things we need to get our heads around when we're talking about um, Holy Island is to remember that the landscape of the island has changed radically since the early medieval period. Most importantly is um, most important major change are these sand dunes, the sand dunes which run along, run, run along the northern edge of the island, and also the sand dune systems which run along much of that um, Northumbrian, northern half of the Northumberland coast. These are almost entirely a, all a product of the late medieval, early modern period. They are a, a, a relatively recent feature. It's very, very easy to think these have got some great antiquity, but actually they're, they're, they're really a product of, of climatic changes really in, in that Little Ice Age period. So when we're looking at the archaeology island, the first thing we need to do is strip off all our, all our sand dunes from up here. And that, that immediately starts changing our, the layout of our understanding of the island. Even in the medieval period, agriculture, you can, on, on a good day, on a good projector, you can probably just about see there's medieval ridge and furrow extending beyond the extent of the later enclosed field systems up into the areas near some of the sand dunes. So it's clear that the medieval period, um, agriculture extended further outside the, the, the current current area. Um, and there's documentary references from the 13th and 14th century to things like rabbit warrens and, and a host of other agricultural exploitation of, of the entire island. Um, another area which has changed quite substantially is, ho is the, 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 uh, the small harbour. Um, here you see this little harbour just down here got the village, this is Holy Island Castle. As it stands today, it presents like a nice little half moon shaped harbour. It's, it's, it's a small fishing fleet, still, still workhouses there. But again, this, this only achieved its, its current shape relatively recently. If you go back to the 17th century, and Margaret Laura Hanley leave Handley is a rather nice map from the mid 17th century, which very clearly shows originally there's quite a large lagoon area behind the, the current, well, what is now the current edge of the harbour. And actually, the sea came right up against the edge of Holy Island Village. And if you go visit the island, there's quite a large drop down just to the east of the Priory, which I've been told on multiple occasions is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a Mesolithic raised beach. It's actually quite clear that the, the landscape changes are actually more to do with what's happening in the 17th century than anything particularly early. Another way in which the landscape of Holy Island has changed is the way we access the island. So today, People, tourists come along the main route from, from Beale, which goes along the northern edge of the Snook. One only has to do a little bit of exploration of earlier mapping. It's quite clear that there were originally a whole range of other alternative routes for getting onto the island. Um, and I, I suspect that actually the route along the, the current route people take is actually a relatively, relatively recent um, origin. It only really seems to emerge as the main route perhaps in the 19th century. Before that, I think the most important route was actually a route which came straight from Holy Island Village. Those of you who know the village go straight down Mary Gate, straight to the edge, and just keep going, um, where you hit a small village called Fenham. And Fenham, crucially, was the state centre for the lands which were owned by Holy Island on the mainland. Um, and I think it makes sense that, that the reason why that, that state centre grew there was because it was at the point the main causeway from Holy Island, Island landed on the mainland. But we've got to be alive for the fact that these routes were obviously constantly changing a series of other possible access routes across old down to Ross down here. So it's a constantly changing landscape, not only the coastal landscape, these sand dunes are liable to come in and out of, of um, the phases where you can use them as causeways and where you can't. Obviously it's a tidal island, so half the time the, the tides are too high, you can't access the island by anything, anything but boat. Um, 
So what do we know about um, uh, the, the, the historical context? Obviously, we're up in North Northumberland, so we're in one of the, the many putative heartlands of the Northumbrian kingdom of Bernicia. Interestingly, the first, well, potentially the first documentary uh, association with Holy Island is actually not related to its important monastic site. The story of Bretonum records that Urien, who's in the uh, late 5th, early, late, late 6th, early 7th century um, British king, was besieging his foes, i.e. the, the Anglo-Saxons who were based at Bambra, besieging his foes in Insula Medcaut, which is a Latin term which is, in, which is glossed as Lindisarne. This appears to be the native British name for, for Holy Island. It does seem actually the first, the first evidence in the documentary record suggests that actually Holy Island was a place of a siege. We'll come on to that in a minute because I, I, I do wonder whether it's possible to be more precise about the precise location of, of that siege. But Lindisarne is obviously better known as, as a monastic centre. It was founded in AD 635 by Oswald. Oswald had just succeeded um, uh, Edwin as king of, of, of the United Northumbria. He spent time in exile in Western Scotland, where A, he converted to Irish school of Christianity um, and had been particularly exposed to, to the, the, the Christianity and, and the monks of Iona. And when he comes over back to his homeland in North Northumberland, he brings monks from Iona back to Northumberland to found a, a new monastic site. And it's very hard to resist the, the, the assumption that by choosing an island site, he's somehow trying to mirror or, or, or create a new, um, a, a new Iona over here on, on the eastern side of, of the country. Um, the figure with which um, Holy Island is most associated with is Cuthbert. Cuthbert is a, joins, joins, uh, joins takes religious orders. He comes from the Scottish borders. He spends time in Melrose. He spends time down in Ripon. But he ends up being a, a prior and then a bishop at, at Holy Island. And, Holy Island and the, the monastery of Holy Island is quite important because it's not just a monastic centre, it's also the seat of, of a bishop. So Cuthbert assumes both roles at varying, varying times. And then, of course, as is well known, he goes off to Farn Island, which is a small island in a farm just across the sea, about a mile and a half away, where he becomes a hermit and spends his last years as a hermit before dying. Now, Cuthbert was the first abbot of Holy Island following the Synod of Whitby. So he is the first um, saint with which the, the community of Holy Island are able to successfully cult who, who is not kind of um, sullied by association with pre, pre um, Synod of Whitby Christianity. For those of you who don't know, Synod of Whitby is essentially the point at which the Kingdom of Northumberland decides it's going to opt for a Roman slash Kentish slash Frankish school of Christianity rather than opting for a, um, a, a, a tradition of Christianity more associated with, with Western Scotland and Ireland. So Cuthbert's his first figure, he's an ideal man, he's, he's, he's a hermit, he does all the things, all those tick box things which a saint ought to do, and he dies in a wonderful way, he have, have miracles, he's buried, and fairly quickly his relics are raised up out of the ground, process of translation, and within you know, 15 years of his death, the cult of Cuthbert becomes a full-blown um, full tradition. The next major event in the archaeology, in the history of Holy Island, is the, the first raid of by one of the first raids by the Vikings. Um, as I was saying to Tom earlier on, there is a stone from Holy Island which has, many of you will recognize it, pictures lots of warriors waving swords, which appears on every single National Ge Geographic documentary about Vikings which has ever been made. Uh, and and, it, and Lindisfarne is always this kind of very easy trope to use when talking about the Vikings. Terrible Vikings, poor innocent monks, Celtic Christians, uh, all the eco warriors before the time, um, and, and the terrible Vikings come on the spoil So that's a very nice story. But of course, it takes nearly you know, 75 years plus before the monks leave the island in the face of continued Viking onslaught, as the conventional narrative has it. They leave, they take the relics of Cuthbert with them and the other relics, and they kind of move round northern England, spending time at Norham spending time at Chester the Street before finally ending up in Durham, which is why the community at Durham, the monastic community at Durham, is the direct linear descendant of the monastic community 
of Holy Island. And this is a wonderfully nice story. The idea of the monks all leaving in 875, as we'll, I'll show in a minute, is actually not something which is actually entirely true. It's quite a nice case where the archaeology can actually start unpicking a little bit of the history. And finally, in the Norman period, the, the Priory is refounded by the monks from Durham. And what you see now of those who visited the island, the upstanding ruins, this little Durham Cathedral in miniature, is essentially this refounded um, monastic community. Um, so let's start with, with, the, with the pre monastic archaeology. I've already told you, mentioned this with reference to uh, siege uh, in Insula Medcount. Well, the, 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 the picture, one, 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 one of the, again, these defining images of, of Lindisfarne is, is the, the image of Holy Island Castle, Lindisfarne Castle. This is, again, appears in lots of films, the plant scheme at death and things. Um, very, very, very kind of strong image. First thing you have to do is mentally erase that castle. It's a post-medieval castle. It's not a medieval castle at all. And what you're left with, once you've got rid of your castle, is a outcrop of wind sill, similar to what Bamber is built on, and a nice kind of saddle shape construction, saddle shaped uh, landmark. And even without the castle, it's a very, very distinctive landscape feature. We started doing a little bit of playing around with LIDAR, and what's actually very clear, and frankly, this is the kind of thing you can see anyway, just we're going to look at the site, is that outcrop stands surrounded on, on several sides by very low-lying marshy ground, which kind of enhances its, its defensive um, capabilities. So I, we, we don't know much about what existed on the island before, on, on, on the outcrop before the castle. We do have this, this mid-16th century plan of a smaller defense on the, on the little outcrop, this little outcrop here, which at some point was obviously demolished before we got the main castle. Um, but what I find particularly interesting is this kind of saddle-shaped rocky outcrop or, or prominence kind of fits into a, a whole category of fortified hilltop sites, which we find in the, the cultural world of, of the northern Britons. Um, obviously, you've got Bamber Castle just across the way, which we know is an Anglo-Saxon power centre. Dunant's perhaps a classic example of one of these fortified rocky outcrops. Trustees Hill is a whole host of these. Uh, kind of Though, although the idea of these so-called nuclear forts uh, was got invented by him, but Leslie Alcock spent a lot of time looking at these kind of sites. And I do just wonder whether there's potential for the, 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 the castle rock itself at Holy Island for having been fortified at some point. We're hoping to put some trenches in there, maybe the year after next, to see whether we can pick anything up. Uh, it, unfortunately, it's one of those kind of sites which is just completely useless for geophysics just because it's a bloody great big stone with magnetic properties, which basically means you can't do any geophysics worth its while on it. Um, but there's potential this could be the site, a site of an early siege. I think it's something which needs further exploration. But it's really the monastery I'm particularly interested in. Um, luckily, Cuthbert generated quite a lot of literature. There are three separate lives of St. Cuthbert, the anonymous life of St. Cuthbert, and Bede wrote two lives of St. Cuthbert, one in prose and one as a metrical life, a, a poetic life. And there's also references, not surprisingly, in Bede um, to other features of, of Holy Island. So we've got some kind of documentary sense of what we might expect to find at, at Holy Island. There's a reference to an outer precinct, by which we can assume there must be an inner precinct as well. There's reference to monastic cells, a guest house, a watchtower, an offshore hermitage, the reference to the cemetery of the brethren, which presumably also implies that there are other cemeteries. But these are all things I think we could probably have, have worked out from parallels from other, other monastic sites. It's all very well known that we have these things. But of course, the more important question is, where actually are they on the ground? Um, the general conventional assumption, I think it's fairly right, fairly fair, is that the site of the Anglo-Saxon monastery is somewhere around the site of the, um, the later priory and parish church. Um, there's a variety of reasons I'll talk about that in a second. One of the troubles we have when we try to understand the archaeology is the problem with the changing post-medieval landscape. Because another, another thing which has changed quite massively is essentially Holy Island seems to be built on quite a large midden of village, contemporary village of, kind of late medieval and post-medieval rubbish, shells, fish bones, 
generic audio, um, which means that actually it's quite hard to get down very easily to, to early earlier archaeological features. It has been done, but, but we've got this problem with it, of this kind of whole, almost a mini little little tell site on which a village has later village has been has been constructed. Um, but you can get a sense of that, that change of topography. And when you look at the, this, is, this is the map you're already seeing, you get a sense that actually the village stands on quite a distinct little uh, promontory and is much more defined by what's it's defined by water on three sides. It's quite a, a, a nice prominent prominent location. And another very distinctive feature of the village is this this thing along here, this rocky outcrop known as known as the hoof, which is part of that, that projection of windsill. If you carry on going, you get to home, you hope to get to the castle over there. And that looks over the whole the whole village. And that, as, as we'll see, I think that's potentially quite an important part of the monastic the monastic complex. Now, so we first of all, when we try to think about un, unpicking the archaeology, we know there's churches. Of course there's churches. It, it's an Anglo-Saxon, it's an Anglo-Saxon monastery. We know there's a wooden church. And B describes as this wooden church built in the manner of the Scots which is a kind of Bedian shorthand, meaning it's built out of wood. And it describes it, it's covered in reeds. It's a rather strange discussion, uh, description of it being entirely covered with plates of lead, which I've, if anybody's got any ideas what that could mean, I, I can't visualise a, a lead covered church. Um, but we have, this is associated with the early stage of the monastery, and it's replaced when Cuthbert becomes a, a fully culted Anglo-Saxon state saint. It, it's replaced by a large... Um, a large stone church, and Cuthbert is placed in a position of honour, his race is placed in a position of honour by, by the altar. We've got some other documentary evidence. Um, on the left, you've got a description of Lindisfarne from the works of Simeon of Durham. Simeon of Durham was a, a Norman historian of the community of St Cuthbert. So he's presumably someone who's got access to both first-hand knowledge and good documentary evidence about Holy Island. And one of, the, he, he makes some general comments about, you know, there's a church, there's cemeteries, all things we would expect. But what's particularly interesting is he talks about the presence of another church, the Green Church, which is sited on the verdant greenness of the plain, and he ordered that women should gather here to hear masses and the word of God, so they should never come any way nearer to the church where he and his monks were. It says how the custom is still, still observed today. That women are not allowed to enter certain parts of the cemeteries and certain churches. Now, this is this 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 idea of pattern of gender segregation is something which we find very strongly in Irish traditions. On, on the right, we've got a, a quote from the Cleccio Canonum Hymenensis, which is a uh, an Irish set of law codes um, describing what a what a, a holy site ought to be. And essentially, we have this description that a holy site ought to have a central area where women are not allowed to come unless they are nuns, unless they are clerics, and how we've got this very strict kind of gender segregation. That's not something we find particularly in, in the Anglo-Saxon church. So I do think perhaps what we've got here in, 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 in the description from Simeon is actually a, a relic perhaps of that Ionian Irish-Scottish influence on the initial laying out and development of, 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 of the cult of St. Cuthbert, this, this, this gender pattern. And interestingly for people who try and Kind of create a a modern Celtic church, and there's a very strong tradition of kind of slightly new age Celtic Christianity on the island, which likes to have Christian the Celtic Christianity as very feminist, gender aware, ecological. You kind of undercut by the fact that the cult of Cuthbert is is even for medieval times particularly misogynistic and very 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 lots of very spatial very direct spatial controls over, over access to religious sites both at uh, Holy Island and and in Durham. So we have this wonderful um, ruined, ruined building, which is essentially the remains of, of, of the Priory Church. It's a the Durham Cathedral in, in miniature. And that's what it's intended to be. Nowadays, you go there, it's good quality historic England lawn, the whole thing. It's very, very, very kind of slightly, slightly kind of sterilized. But you go back into the 18th to 19th century, it was very much a, a, a ruin. And despite all the, all the romantic hints in all these pictures, it's quite clear that actually a lot of, lot of the buildings that have basically collapsed inside, the whole thing was, was filled with rubble. But it's when these, uh, the, the monastery, the, the priory layout was cleared in the, the late 19th, early 20th century, that 
a whole series of fragments of Anglo-Saxon sculpture were found. I think this is probably the best evidence we've got, but actually we are looking at the general site of the Anglo-Saxon monastery. Um, and there is a, a, a considerable assemblage of this material. Frustratingly, the, the quality of these of the early archaeology and the early clearances was not great, to be honest. And there's very little direct reference at precisely which parts of, of the, the uh, the uh, enclosure, the various bits of sculpture came from. But what's interesting is when you look at plot out the dates of the sculpture, obviously you have to allow a certain latitude and the ability to date these things precisely. Um, but if, broadly speaking, if we try and plot out the evidence of the sculpture, we have a nice range of sculpture from the 7th century all the way through to the 11th century. And what's quite interesting is if we're looking at the evidence for the community leaving Holy Island in 875, it's not there in the sculpture. If anything, we've actually got a, a slight rise in the 10th century in the amount of sculpture being produced on the island. So it's fairly clear that whilst perhaps the abbots, some of the leading monks in the relics, certainly left Lindisfarne, it wasn't deserted. There continued to be a monastic presence at the site. And not just that, a monastic presence which is capable of attracting patronage and investment, presumably by, by, by elites who are willing to invest in Anglo-Saxon sculpture, and equally, if it's not the elite, the, the secular elites investing, investing in sculpture at the site, it must be the church investing in sculpture at the site. So either way, there seems to be a continued voting confidence in, 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 in the presence of, of some kind of community on the island. Another interesting feature about the churches in Holy Island is this, this linear arrangement. And here you can see the main priory church and the parish church of St. Mary's, which is continuously the parish church. And you can see that they are axially aligned. And that kind of axial linear alignment is very typical of Anglo-Saxon churches. And it shows particularly uh, influence from the Frankish church. If you think about sites like Saint-Denis, sadly in the news today, but Saint-Denis, the, the, the basilica, the great excavations of the Merovingian and Carolingian churches, shows serried ranks of, of linear aligned churches. This is essentially what we have here, which is two axially aligned churches. And I think, again, circumstantial, admittedly, but, but I think fairly good circumstantial evidence that we've got here the footprints of two earlier Anglo-Saxon churches which have been rebuilt and, and reworked. I think the fact that they had that Frankish influence, again, suggests that they were probably laid out post-Whitby, uh, possibly post-Cuthbert. There may be the laying out of these two churches occurring as part of that saint-making saint campaign with which the production of the Lindisfarne Gospels was also associated. Inside the Church of, of Holy Island, most of it is, is clearly 12th, 13th century. There are just hints potentially of Anglo-Saxon fabric. We have this small round arch here underneath the, the, the later pointed arch, which might be an Anglo-Saxon chancel arch, but it might equally just be a relieving arch for, for the chancel arch as it stands. But there are just, there's clearly some hints of phasing within this wall. So there are tentative hints that there may be Anglo-Saxon fabric in there. Um, and other people suggested there's a tiny bit of Anglo-Saxon fabric just down here, but it needs continued, uh, more detailed survey. One feature which no one really draws attention with to, but I, I, I find fascinating, is this doorway up here. I, there's lots and lots of examples of doorways, the western end of of, of, of churches for liturgical purposes with balconies and that kind of thing. I can find very few examples of doorways like this. It doesn't seem to be connected to a rood loft or anything like that, but it's, I can only find one parallel from, and that's from, from an Anglo-Saxon church at Hart, in Hartlepool. Um, so everybody knows of doorways up like that. Tell me afterwards. In terms of actual archeology span though, the site's been relatively ill-served. Um, and it's been, it's, been slightly, it's been quite an unlucky place in terms of actual archaeology because so much of it hasn't been published. Um, in 1962, Brian Hope Taylor came over to Holy Island, hot foot from finishing off his excavations at Yevery. And he carried out a series of excavations on the island. Um, he carried out, and I'm not sure how many of you know about Hope Taylor. He, he didn't die that long ago, but he'd fallen out of archaeology a long time beforehand for a variety of reasons. Um, and his archives are very much rescued from the skip and, and, and taken, up, taken up to Scotland. And it's only recently that I, I've been able to actually get hold of his, what limited archives survive 
uh, associated with his work at Holy Island. And what's clear is he excavated features to the west of the parish church, and this is very quick and dirty geo-referencing uh, uh, um, to the west here. Um, there are a series of trenches he's put, put in, unlike Yevering, which is a big open area excavation, we've got two or three fairly small trenches, but at least one of them produces a hint of a, um, a ditch running that way, so running down the edge of the down the slope towards the coast. What's interesting is that ditch appears to predate the ceramic horizon um, because it, 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 it's, it's part, partly overlaid by clearly 12th, 13th, 14th century medieval occupation. So it could potentially date to the period of, of the early medieval monastery, but equally it could date to the Iron Age or, or even earlier in prehistory. But it's difficult to it's difficult to understand. And frustratingly, all of Hope Taylor's finds have gone missing. He also carried out work um, on, the, on, the, on the hoof. Now, the hoof had always attracted archaeological scholarship. There have been a series of ranging in good and bad quality uh, investigations on, on the hoof and earthwork surveys. You can't see very clearly from this, but there's a whole series of earthworks and late, earlier and later features up along, along this bit of ridgeway. Um, 1897, Blackwell was the first person to really, really record it. But Hope Taylor excavated three trenches on, on the hoof. His trench two is the most important one, which he put over his little rectangular structure. But he also put one kind of run down the edge of the hoof here and here. And the idea was to try and kind of ground truth what, what might be there on the basis of, of the earthwork survey. This is, these are his um, digitized plans of that rectangular structure in his trench two. Um, Hope Taylor thought it was a church. I can see nothing there which looks particularly churchy. He did, he did comments in his notes that it was aligned west-east, but as you notice, the hoof is aligned west-east. So I'm, I'm not particularly convinced about, um, even if it wasn't, I think trying to, try and, trying to identify a church on the basis of the alignment structure, a little bit dubious. But what's clear is he, he didn't remove the whole thing. The earthworks are there. What's also interesting is there's no ceramic evidence from this. So it, it does seem that it may date from that pre, that 12th, 13th century ceramic horizon. So it's, it has got the potential of being a, a broadly early medieval structure. As it's still there, there's also scope for going in, potentially trying to sample it, trying to find some organic material we can try some C14 dates from. That one's a little bit further on down the line. There are three other places we've had archaeology on the island. Um, only one of which has been published. Excavations by Deirdre O'Sullivan uh, on the Visitor Centre, an excavation on the Lindisfarne Mead Shop, an excavation on some community housing up here called Castleview Gardens. We'll start with my very badly found image of the, um, the early medieval features at the English Heritage Visitor Centre. Feast your eyes on that. A, 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 a two, kind of metre and a half of, of crude cobbles and a small pit. Um, which is the entire early medieval horizon um, from, from this feature. Um, it did produce a, an allegedly 10th century ring pin from the general area. Of course, that was unstratified and was floating around um, higher up. Um, so there are potential hints that we might have some surviving early medieval activity here, but it's very little of it, and it's very hard to actually particularly interpret. It does bode well for the possibility of, of features surviving. Another feature which has survived, uh, another place which has produced possible uh, Anglo-Saxon activity is uh, under, under the winery, the, the Lindisfarne Mead Shop. These were development control archaeology done in advance of, of, of the extension to the shop back in the early 2000s. And once they got through all, all the post-medieval and medieval dumps of rubbish, they got through to a series of features which seemed, again, seem to be broadly pre-ceramic. So I think that probably gives us a sense they're probably pre-12th century. Um, there is, looking over at Steve, there is a bone comb, which I, I have spent three years trying to get hold of to get a photograph of it. Um, and I, I promise I will send it to you if I ever get to see it. Um, but it, it is allegedly clearly an early medieval comb type. I would have to trust the grain literature on this one. Um, and again, it's clearly 
tantalizing thanks for the word i'm looking for tantalizing evidence of of survival of early medieval features but again it took quite a lot of digging to get down to these potentially early medieval layers the final site where there has been some early medieval activity identified within the village is Castleview Gardens. This, this is again was development control work done in advance of building community, community housing. Here we're out on the edge of the village and actually the depth down to what might be early medieval materials you can see is, is far less. And what we're looking at, a potential, potentially big splat, which is meant to be a ditch, um, a possible Anglo-Saxon building with burnt daub, lots of interesting features lots of things which should in theory be dateable using using this c14 the frustrating thing is although this is excavated in 2006 all the archives all the samples and all the finds have gone missing um so we can't be sniffy about antiquarians unfortunately it hit the great north museum just as it's all being reorganized and i've been in and i've looked at the curator we can't find it anywhere so this is a, a frustratingly again tantalizing hint that there must be survival of early medieval material there also label your archives i think that's a really good <laughs> cautionary tale so on the basis of that i spent i just spent a long time taking my students up to to Holy island there have been other archaeological work done in the wider island which i'll talk about in a minute it's been done by a team from leicester um, but that finished in the early, early 90s, really. And I spent a long, long time visiting the site students. Um, where I suddenly thought, hold it, I'm an early medievalist to be interested in early medieval monastic sites. <laughs> why, why, why don't we try and do some field work here? Because it had been 20 years since the last campaign. Um, so one of the first things we did was carry out a, a, a large scale geophysical survey. There had been early geophysical surveys done, but it had been done, been done in the 80s when the technology wasn't terribly uh, sophisticated and of course one of the big problems is the wind sill basalt it has got it's got magnetic so you can't use magnetometry on 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 the wind sill itself but nonetheless we've got some money from national geographic to do a fairly large um survey trying to get as many of the green areas around the center of the village as is is realistically possible and you can see we've got all sorts of features and we're focusing on some of them in a minute Lots and lots of medieval and post-medieval ridge and furrow and drainage. A thing here, which is a rectilinear enclosure, which might be Iron Age, looks like some of the Iron Age enclosures you find on the Northumberland coastal plain on the mainland, but without excavation could turn out to be anything. The two areas I want to focus on are area 12 to the east of the Priory Church and this area up, sorry, up, this area up here, kind of behind, um, behind the houses of the village on the western coast of the island. So this is what we get, what we found in, in, in the fields to the east of the Priory Church. The first thing, obvious thing, which should leap out at you is this, which is, it's a monastery, but it's, it's, it's the wrong period. So we found a, a, a new cloister to the Priory, which is probably an infirmary cloister. So it, you can just about see it with the eye of faith when you look at some of the aerial photographs, but it, it took the geophysics to really, to really draw it out. And that was clearly related to the, 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 the later kind of post-conquest Priory. What's more interesting are, are a series of, of features up here. There's this big long linear, which I suspect is probably part of the medieval, the medieval monastery, because it's kind of aligned on, on that eastern edge of the, of, of the um, cloister. And some of these other linear things might be related to that larger monastic enclosure from the post-conquest priory. But there are a series of possible things here, which are potentially more interesting. And here's, here's, here's the interpretation. Um, so potential structures here, um, which would be useful to have another have a look at. Now, word of caution: um, following, the, following the dissolution of the monasteries, there was a plan in the 16th century to turn Lindisfarne Priory into a fortified strong point. Because we're up on the Scottish border, obviously Berwick has big contemporary defences, and there were plans, and these are plan those proposed defences um, to to defend the monastery. Now they were never allegedly never carried out. I do just slightly wonder whether some of you can see these kind of strange kind of baffled entrance. I do wonder whether that might be related to some of the features we're finding we're finding here. The trouble with this plan is it looks very nice, but it's actually it's completely out of whack. So it's quite we can't really georeference it precisely. But I do wonder whether we've got possibly 16th century defences. 16th century activity 
equally, it is on this structure particularly is kind of on the same alignment as the two churches, uh, and it's, there's potential that it might it might be it might be earlier. And when we when we when we're out in the field next summer, one of our plans is to put some more evaluation trench through the structure just to try and get sense of what it might be and, and, and the kind of quality of survival. This field has been on the part as part pasture essentially for the last 150 years. There's, there are hints of Richard Faro, but basically it's been used as, as rough pasture. So preservation should be okay. Another area I'm particularly interested in is this area to, to the west of, of the um, village. There's been lots of attempts to draw possible monastic enclosures around Hell uh, it, it, it's, it's a kind of good it's a good pastime for, pe for people who are interested in early Anglo-Saxon churches of playing kind of hunt the enclosure. Where you try and find alignments and extend the red lot dotted line, and you say, "Da da, I've got a monastic enclosure." And Holy Island has been victim to that a lot. Um, so, we, one of the things we were hoping we'd find with the geophysical survey is some hint of a of a large boundary ditch. One potential boundary had always been the line of Mary Gate, which runs along the NT Island and kind of would cut off the edge of the um, peninsula. However, what's clear both from this geophysics and from some of those early maps is actually Mary Gate originally carried on straight down to the edge of the island, and that's where the causeway off to Funham originally departed from. And we can see with hints of a road running along here. What you haven't got is a big boundary ditch. Now, monastic vallum don't have to be big ditches. There can be you know, other shapes and forms, but there's certainly nothing very obvious there. What is more interesting is there seems to be more of a distinction between this area to the south, with what's lots of what looks like industrial activity, and an area to the north, of this line which has lots of well, paddocks and field enclosures and um, again it's playing playing the old game but it's just one up from lay lines i admit but this is priory lane running through straight across there so we do seem to have some kind of possible boundary now this may all be 91 may all be 20th century farm part tract parts um, but the only way to find out is to again try and put a small trench through that and that's going to be the focus of our other small evaluation trench next summer just to try and get a grip of what some of these some of these features are so we can play we can play games trying to reconstruct what what, what our, our, our monastery might be like and this is this is where we really are skirting on, on the edge of, of um, just sheer creativity here um, we have our, our two aligned probable anglo-saxon monastic churches maybe we've got another one here maybe not we don't know hints of the boundary maybe another boundary maybe Marygate itself was a third boundary because we should have a series of broadly concentric boundaries we've got activity in the visitor center area we've got anglo saxon activity in the winery we've got this thing whatever's going on in castle view which where the archives have gone and that's outside any possible monastic boundary we've also got an interesting documentary reference to <laughs> cemetery of saint columba who of course is a saint associated with Iona and it's clear from the documentary references in the Priory accounts that this was not the main monastic cemetery it was another cemetery somewhere else within the village and there are antiquarian references to the discovery of human remains in this area up here so potentially we may have another part of that early Anglo-Saxon site one site I've not mentioned particularly uh, is St Cuthbert's Isle which is almost certainly the location of a small a small um, hermitage site there's a Later, there's the remains of a later, a later chapel, and maybe earlier things underneath it, which we shall see. Um, and again, that's a site we're hoping to come and visit in the next year or two because it's suffering from from erosion from from the sea. But, that, but this is a very tentative kind of um, attempt to just try and get a grip on what we might be looking at, at on on Holy Island. There are other features. This is this 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 the my I found this, this is the in, in serendipity. This is the rock I chose to put my sandwiches on when I was sitting underneath um, ho uh, underneath the castle. This is a rock on the north side of the castle. It's a whole series of boulders, fast boulders, sitting on that slope. And you can hopefully see there is a, a knotted cross incised onto it. It's clearly of some antiquity. That particular type is, 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 is pre, probably pre-Norman. There are references in the life of, life of St. Cuthbert, the life of St. Cuthbert, to people going around the island, praying at holy places, seemingly around the island. So I wonder whether we've possibly got one of those holy prayer places. And again, that kind of tradition of making a tour or a pilgrimage around an island is something which 
find strong parallels in, in Irish traditions of, of Christianity. We need to be a little bit careful, though, because the best evidence of that emergence of that Irish pilgrimage round around Ireland, a place like Inish Murray, particularly, best known example, that doesn't seem to develop until maybe the 8th or 9th century. So perhaps that might be a little bit late for us to try and invoke Ionian connections, but it's certainly something which deserves a little bit more investigation. Elsewhere on the island, and the focus of the work by the, um, the Leicester team is a green shield, which sits on the northern edge of the island. Um, here is a small farmstead sited right, you see its location right on the northern edge of the island amidst, amidst the sand dunes, decorated by Rob Young and, and Deirdre O'Sullivan. Uh, a series of these nice long houses. This one here is this structure down here, associated with, with large numbers of cattle bones, particularly calf bones. Um, calves who need to make parchment. There may be a link here, or it might be there might be there for other reasons. What's interesting again is all the all the artifactual evidence of some coins, the spearhead, all point to a 9th, 10th century date. So again, that's after the monks have left the island. Now, of course, this is not within the monastic area anyway, but it certainly attests to a the presence of people on the island in the 9th and 10th century, and also the fact they've got access to to coinage suggests they are reasonably, you know, they are in some way integrated in, in, into the wider economy, despite its very, very remote location. Metal detector finds. Um, there's not been an awful lot of metal detecting on the island, um, but there has, this is a one fragment of any interest. Um, uh, it's, I'm not, sure, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the technical term is. A, 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 it's always a mount or a fitting, isn't it? So it's either, it's either a mount slash fitting. Um, it basically means I'm not quite sure what it is. Stylistically, it could potentially be the late Anglo-Saxon. It could equally be pushed into the Norman thing. I've showed it to, I've showed it to people who work on Norman material, and they're like, mm, maybe. And people who work on Anglo-Saxon and, and insular metalwork are also, mm, maybe. So it, 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 it tentatively... Um, a piece of early medieval metalwork, but it's without a context. It's, it's all there is of it. We haven't got anything else. So it's, it's nice, but again, like so much of the archaeology island, frustrating, just hinting at what, what, might be, what might be there. One of the things I'm particularly interested in with the island is to try and place the monastery in its context, both its, its, its kind of ritual, political, and, and, and economic context. I'm like particularly interested in trying to get a sense of how the monastery sits within its wider landscape. There's, there's, a, there's a certain tendency within people working on early medieval monastic sites to see island sites as remote hermitages. I think that's one thing that Lindisfarne is not. It's on an island, but it's on an island two miles away from a major power center. It's on a sea route, which was clearly being used heavily. It's, it might be an island, but it is not detached from the wider world. It's clearly very, very closely integrated with the wider world, and as such, it's exploiting a whole range of, of economic resources. There's already hints of the farming from, from um, the, 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 the herding of cattle, um, from the evidence from Green Shield. Um, there's also a reference by Bede who says it's not rich in gold but, but rich in cattle. So, again, hints of the kind of sources it may be, may be drawing on. He talks a lot about the about the um, maritime and fish resources, which I'm, I'm particularly interested in how they're exploiting the coastal resources. Nearby, there's a whole series of fish traps in Boodle Bay, it's about two miles away, just the other side of, um, of Ross. These are all undated at the moment. Um, they may well be late. I've not been able to find any documentary references to them at all in medieval or post-medieval context. So that I do just wonder where they have the potential of being early medieval, certainly within land, an area which is controlled by, by the community. So there's potential of, of and you know, obviously there's lots of good examples of early medieval fish traps from elsewhere. So these are one of the things we're hoping to come back and have a look at at some point. We're also finding um, bits of piles of shells coming out the islands um, all over the place. Um, we have two phase middle here, the very long spring line coming from the top of the beach, where, near where we want to put our, our first trench, that's around the back of the pub, for those of you who don't know Holy Islands. Um, just a road, that's just eroding out the section, the farmer had put a small trap down there, and it was just sitting there. Lots of other places where shells are eroding out of itself, 
exposed section, coastline. Now, Ho Yi Island was a major fishing village for throughout the medieval period and the post-medieval period. The herring fishing, but also their lot there catching white fish of their long line basin. So I suspect this is mainly limpet. So this one's mainly limpet. So I suspect that could be post-medieval just baiting middens. But there are you know, other early medieval midden sites further up the north coast, up to the upper Aberdeenshire, of early medieval dates. So there's no reason to think there's not potential of some kind of early medieval explo exploitation of, of shell resources. But at the moment, this could be anything from Mesolithic to 19th century. So again, we're hoping to look at more targeted look at some of these, these features, which, which vary widely in scale. I've talked about the, the, the land resources, and this is one of the important things to remember, is Holy Island is a, a, a centre of, 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 of considerable territory. Um, if we look at some of the place names in the immediate area, Cheswick, Gosset, Beale, Kylo, Fennec, these are all areas within the estates on the mainland held by, by Holy Island. If we look at the range of names, Cheese Farm, Goose Farm, Bee Hill, these are, all the, these are all the kind of names which, which indicate agricultural exploitation, and it's the kind of range of documentary names you might associate with evidence for an early medieval multiple estate, where you've got a large area of land being exploited, specialist uses of different farms across the area. I'm quite interested in things like these Fenham sites in Cheswick, where it's down, again down by marshy areas, where we're getting things like salt marsh exploitation, and certainly from some of the bone isotope work done on bones from Bambra, the Bowl Hole Cemetery in Bambra, did hint that there may be exploitation of animals which have been um, grazed on, on salt marsh resources. So it's important to remember that even, even the marshy areas, these boggy areas, um, we, we, can, we can play lots of psychogeography games and put Grendel in there, or we can actually see them as good, important economic resources which were exploited by, by, by the monastery. Um, over, over, over time. Um, we have this body known as Island Shire, uh, which survives into the medieval and even into the post-medieval period, which is why into the 19th century, although we're in the north of Northumberland, this area was part of County Durham. And again, we have a whole series of estate centres and dependent chapels. And crucially, as I mentioned, Fenham here was the estate centre for the entire, of, entire area of Island Shire, and it was from Fenham that that early causeway seems to have gone. So it's clear that this is an island that looks landward. And actually what's interesting, if you stand you know, on the corner of Holy Island Village and look landward, this is essentially the view shed. This essentially is what you see is, is Island Shire. Maybe not quite in the north, and obviously some areas right down here you can't see. There's more or less everything you can see from, from the, the island mainland, which I think, I think is, 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 is quite important. But there's a whole series of territories. Obviously, the island had the, the monastery had its own immediate estates from which it was drawing its own home farm, its domain farming. But it's clear that also we know it was a, 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 a diocese, centre of a diocese. So there's other kind of territories attached to the diocese. There's luckily there's various descriptions about how far this diocese went. Um, some at some points that diocese was clearly quite large, but there are other unclear kind of boundaries of territory. So we have this from the Historia de Sancto Cathartain, which is another one of the products of the historical work being done at the community of St. Cuthbert in Durham. It talks about the boundary of the territory of Lindisfarne. But it's not clear whether this is the territory of a diocese, or territory of an estate. So it doesn't seem to match to either. But certainly at some point, some people thought that the area belonging to Lindisfarne extended from River Tweed at the north, and much further south. So this, this suggests it goes all the way down to the River Till and all the way down to the Bremish. And potentially it's much larger than that area um, defined by, by, by Island Shire. So again, there's hints that perhaps it was owning other estates. Of course, it would have acquired land over time. So again, it, it's, it's, it's a we need to emphasize the dynamic nature of, it, of its acquisition of, of lands and estates. Um, yeah, it's clear as a major monastery, it was also had possessions much, much further away. So in, in the um, Historia Regum, again, one of these um, historical products by, by Stephen of Durham, he talks about the possessions of the Sea of Lindisfarne, and he lists a series of monastic sites. Melrose, um, Sigbrethingham, which is unlocated. Alex Wall suggested it might be Stowe and Redale, the Scottish borders. Uh, Yodicur, that's probably Abercorn. Petherham, 
probably Abilady up um, on the Lothian coast, Old Home, which of course has been the site of some really interesting excavations in the last couple of years, Tyningham, Coldingham, Norham, and this site, Tilmouth, which is again another site which particularly interests me. Tilmouth is very easy to locate because it's a river till and it's at the mouth of it. Um, and interesting, if you go and look at the mouth of the river till, there is a chapel to Saint, dedicated to Kent Cuthbert right in the middle of the field. And if you look at the crop marks, there are hints of a large enclosure surrounding it. So there's hints of, of, of a previously overlooked Anglo-Saxon monastic site. So what we've got at Hoyong, we've got a monastery itself, a monastic centre, which are hints of archaeology, but it's clearly great for doing more research. We've got potential for early medieval exploitation of the island itself, the Green Shield. We've got use of the coastal resources, both in terms of potentially fish traps, but also, you know, we, we know we know that they were, they were kind of eating fish to a certain extent. We've got hints at the use of salt marshes. Um, we then have our, 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 our monastic estates on the mainland, our island shire. Um, we then have potentially a whole series of dependent or at least some way related monastic sites spreading across much of northern, northern Northumberland all the way up into, into, into East Lothian. So what, what I want to try and do as I develop this subject, this, this, this project, is to try and take a scaled approach to this and actually, yes, have focused archaeology on site also try and understand how it fits into to the much, much bigger picture. I'm also very interested in, in, in the legacy of the monastery. Um, obviously, the, 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 the importance of, of the early medieval site there, that's why the priory, the priory is re-established re in the 11th century. But what's particularly interesting is the way the whole site, Hoyan is almost rediscovered as a site of religious pilgrimage in, in the 19th century. So there's a whole series of these great Catholic revival pilgrimages going on in, in, the, in, the, in the later 19th century to places like Lastonbury and Iona and Lindistan. And here we see um, priests and congregation and very wet looking choir boys coming up from, from Tyneside, again, a very big burgeoning Irish population, particularly on Tyneside. And we have this kind of growth of these new pilgrimage sites following that pilgrimage route, route across, getting the train as far as, as far as Beale, then you can walk across and you start, it, this is growth of the idea, but it, it's a site of pilgrimage. If you go around the village today, there are sorry, three or four churches. There's a thriving, broadly to be, um, Celtic, brackets, new age, number of, sort of how retreat houses associated with that. And, and, and the whole issue of Celtic Christianity is very much to the fore, which is interesting because the Celtic Christian, that's a horrible phrase, but the Irish Christian stage of Holy Island lasted a grand total of 30 years, if that. Yet that is what the legacy, where the legacy, that's what people are most interested in. They get very, very bored by, by, by the Anglo-Saxons. They're very, very interested in, in, in this notion of, of, of the Celtic past. And again, there are now lots of tensions on the island today. And this, this is a photo taken last year when somebody wanted to extend one of the retreat houses on the island. Um, a kind of a secular backlash, I'm not sure what you want to call it. Um, I expect a lot of it's down to local, local politics, which I'm slightly low to think it's involved with. But again, it, it, it suggests there's a lot of kind of legacies important but there are tensions within, within the, the, wider, the wider village. And more generally, I'm, I'm increasingly interested in looking at the, the long-term biography of the islands. I spent most of the day writing about 19th century herring fishing on the island. Um, but I, 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 th I think it's, it's a nice opportunity to take a, take a community, a nicely founded community, and try and follow it through in the long term. So whilst the focus of the project is going to be on, on that Anglo-Saxon stuff, we're also going to be trying to understand how the island community evolves through the medieval and post-medieval period until today. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is a ceramic horizon, but I, I was kind of ignored because, I, because I'm focusing on the early medieval. The ceramic horizon is kind of 12th century. That's when it all seems to kick in. And once you get to 12th century stuff, there's a lot of pottery. So it's a, yeah. So that would be why it's particularly interesting if there is anything there, of course. Yes. Are you aware of a boundary banking ditch um, more or less opposite the footpath across from the menu? Let's find a map. Right back to the beginning. Very quick way of doing this. Or maybe you think it is. I believe me. There's all sorts of things going on underneath, going on underneath these sand dunes. There's all sorts of things there which I haven't touched on because we've got no idea what they are. There are enclosures there which are clearly not. not it's much further down than that. Um, you see the bright green field and there's a small field above, with, um, further down. And down near it, come down to the um, village. Yeah. There's that, the green field. Yeah, and then there's um, a narrow field above. I think it's uh, yeah. That 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 we think that's a uh, headland. So maybe one of the medieval fields. It does show up in geophysics. Are you so, sure it's just there? Uh, we can, <laughs> <laughs> let's go through to the geophysics. I think it's this thing down here as a distinct. Um, it continues across the road as well. Yeah, that's where we, that's where we run out of money at that, <laughs> at that point. Um, I'll go back and have a look at that. Yeah, on my feeling is it does seem to be related to the field systems, but definitely worth having a look at. On the uh, second to last slide, I was curious if the art supported the picture of people walking across. That's from the Illustrated London News. I can't give the date off. I don't know who. I, I think it's the Illustrated London News press scribbler. Um, I'm sure it'll be. I'd have a look and see if I can find that for you. Yes. Do we know what Metcalf Lee was? Yeah. It's, it has been suggested it might mean to do with doctors, medicine, but with a lot of this etymology, you pay your money, take your, take your choice, to be quite honest. That's. Yeah. <laughs> so. But that might that might hint at some kind of healing reputation of the island before the monastery, but I'd be loath to put much weight on it without finding something else. Any final questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you again, David. Thank you. Um, and uh, if anybody would like to come and join us, we will be heading to Harkers after this. So if you think of any questions on the way, please come along with us. Uh, thank you very much again. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.